Okay, let's take our Bibles this morning. We're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture, but I, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 18 through 20. The Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20, Well, back up to verse 17. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, this morning I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord, for just this time that we can continue to look at what the Bible says concerning spiritual warfare and how to resist the enemy. For we know, Lord, that all of us need to be informed as to who is against us and what is against us. We are dealing with our flesh, our remaining corruption. We're dealing with the world and its uh, system of thought that is against us. And we are dealing with uh, the enemy and his minions that are against those who are in Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to not only recognize, but be able to resist when he does come against us, when he does manipulate the truth and lie to us. Help us to know how to detect when he wants to present half-truths in a way that sound true, and we'd be able to detect that as your children. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So this morning, I am really uh, springboarding off the passage of Scripture in the Bible, where it does tell us that we are to resist the enemy. That's part of our, that's part of the exhortation, the obligation for Christians to resist. And of course, that means, as it says in 1 Peter 5, 9, which I've been looking at this whole time, to resist him, that's the enemy, firm in your faith, or firm in the faith. And so this morning, I'm going to be continuing on the sixth one, the ones that we've had already, were to resist him, the adversary in the faith. Secondly, uh, second way of resisting the adversary is by discerning your strengths and weaknesses and tendencies towards sin and then fighting against him with the word of God. Thirdly, it's that of to resist the antagonist by maintaining a sanctified imagination. And then fourthly, a fourth way to resist the adversaries by putting off sin and putting on righteousness. A fifth way, which we looked at last week, was that of resisting by putting on Christ and looking at a passage of Scripture from Romans, which it said there, the night is almost gone, the day is near, therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but here it is, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And so we also noticed last week that to put on our armor, to put on Christ, means Christ is our armor, he is the truth, He is our righteousness. He is our peace and good news. He is the faithful one. He is uh, our salvation, and he is the word of God. And so today we're going to be looking at the sixth way in resisting the enemy, and it's the way of to resist him by warfare praying. We have already learned that spiritual sobriety 
will be important for two aspects or two specific purposes found in 1 Peter, and that was in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, if you care to look there in 1 Peter 4, 7, because that's the passage that I've been looking at, the book that I've been preaching through, it says in verse number Chapter one in verse number, or chapter four in verse number seven, it says, "The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment, sober and sober spirit, for the purpose of prayer." So prayer becomes a very important uh, and a vital thing for all Christians to be involved with. And of course, the second purpose found in chapter five in verse number eight was to be sober of sober spirit to be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So we see very clearly that we are to keep awake. We are to keep alert with all our faculties under control in order, for this reason, to give ourselves to public and private prayer. Now, when the church first began recorded in the book of Acts, uh, there were several means of grace that God established right in the beginning in order for a body of believers, wherever they may be in the world, uh, whether it be small or large, to become strong and stable and mature. It included learning the apostles' doctrine, fellowship of believers, meeting together as believers, And then the breaking of bread, that's the Lord's table, and also a meal would go with that. And then corporate prayer. It was the public meeting together to pray, that the body would meet together and pray. So Christians, really having having believed in Jesus Christ for salvation, have a new standing before God because of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death. And in that standing, they never... That uh, a standing that they never had before, able to approach God, able to come into the presence of God. They repented and believed and were granted forgiveness of their sins. And because of the forgiveness of their sins, they now can approach God in prayer. They don't have to go through a ceremony. They don't have to go through human priests. They just come anywhere, anytime before God and bring before God Uh, their prayers and requests and some of the reasons for that is because they we all realize that we're we're kind of helpless uh, as believers in this world and we do have a logical conviction that God alone can help us as as the psalmist said whom do I have in heaven but you and besides you I desire nothing on earth and then he said this my flesh and my heart they may fail me but God is my strength. He's the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So in, another, in a very real way, we feel our weakness, and at the same time, we know that we really get our strength from our fellowship with God and with believers and in that time of prayer. So warfare praying is of vital importance for the Christian during their sojourn on this earth that Christians can actually call unto the living God and they know that he will hear them and answer them according to his will. He's available. There's no busy signals when you call unto God. There's no machines with a metallic voice saying all lines are busy now. God is not busy. He's ready and open to hear the prayers of his children, of his saints. So you'll never hear from God that he's not there. He's always there. And thank God that we Christians have a Savior who can actually hear our prayers, understands everything we say to him, and is compassionate and eager to bend down his ear to hear what's going on. And what a privilege that is. But I think that we often take that privilege way too lightly. We take for granted, for some even seldom use this. If you read through the Word of God, the power and the privilege in Scripture we see of those who walked with God is all over the place. Just consider 
the time Scripture mentions prayer, Moses prayed and three million slaves got, went free. Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. Gideon prayed and with 300 men he defeated a huge army of the Midianites. Samson prayed and destroyed more Philistines in his death than, in his, whole, than his whole life. David prayed and killed the great giant Goliath with a shepherd's a shepherd boy's sling and a five smooth stones, just use one of them. Elijah prayed and stopped the rain for three and a half years and prayed again, and it, the, the rain resumed. Isaiah prayed, and when the armies of the Assyrians surrounded the city of Jerusalem that next morning, when he humbly be, prayed before the Lord, Lord, we're not gonna, we, we can't stand before such a great army. We need your help. That night, an angel of the Lord came and slaughtered 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. They were found dead around the walls of Jerusalem. And then the king went with his tail between his legs, the Assyrian king, back, and his, one of his sons finally, I believe, assassinated him. King Hezekiah prayed, and God extended his life for 15 years. Joshua prayed from the middle, or excuse me, Jonah prayed from the middle of the stomach of a great fish in the depths of the sea, and soon he was spat upon dry ground. Job prayed in the middle of his sufferings, and the latter end of Job was greater than the former. Daniel prayed and stomped the mouths of lions, and those are just a few. These are some few examples in scriptures that encourages us that we ought to do the same thing about with, in prayer that those have done who've gone before us. But there are some here today who pray very little, who perhaps hardly pray at all. You ask them why? Well, they may respond to you something like this. Well, I have prayed and I tried to pray, and I don't think God answered me, so I guess I just kind of gave up praying, and I don't really do it anymore. This man said here that some of the reasons why we, we really don't pray uh, is because we, we don't really plan to pray. Why is there a dearth of this activity in the modern church? Paul Gardner, who said this, he said it, it is perhaps one of the strangest anomalies of the modern church that while we, it often spends much time talking about how evil the world is and how dreadful society has become, that same church spends little time or no time in prayer. And I'm not saying that we don't spend time in prayer here. We do. But we all have to be admonished to get in Scripture to not let this go by the wayside because this is a very important thing that all believers must be involved with. He went on to say that the result of lack of prayer is everywhere to be seen for the spiritual Forces of evil are at work in our midst. Consumerism and materialism and individualism are really on the bound. And, of course, other gods of our age seem to have influenced our Christian thinking far more deeply than we imagine. We shall only keep alert properly when we pray together. So why is it that God's children give up or don't have a significant prayer life? Well, probably this is the reason why, because we don't plan to. It was one Christian minister who says, unless I'm badly mistaken, one of the main reasons so many of God's children don't have a significant life of prayer is not so much that they don't want to, but they just don't plan to. And so it happens like this, that I want to pray, but then we begin to say, Lord, I, I want to pray, but I'm, I'm so busy, I can't seem to find the time. 
So nothing really gets ready in order to pray. And the opposite of planning is always to be in a rut. Unplanned prayer brings our spiritual life to its lowest ebb in vitality. So the admonition has to be, let us take time this very day to rethink our priorities and how our prayer life fits in. We have to make some new resolve today. Try some new venture with God. Set some time. Set a place. Choose a portion of Scripture to guide you through that. Don't be tyrannized by the press of busy days. We're all busy. We're all not from pillar to post. It seems like the information just presses on us so much that those those things that we carry around with us all day, that chip and bleep beep and vibrate to let us know something's trying to get a hold of us. What a distraction it is. It's not a bad thing to just shut the phone off, just put it aside for a period of time and, and remove all obstacles or interferences so we can actually take time to pray. So make this day, a day of turning to prayer for the glory of God and for really the fullness of your own joy because you're going to find it becomes a very joy-filled activity when you are bringing things to God in prayer. So in other words, we must pray for ourselves. We must pray for all the saints that Satan does not lull us into sleep in these days and make us silent and mute. We must develop a strategic plan for praying. It is not rocket science. It is not that difficult. At least in theory, it's not. But in opposition, it is. Because everything's against you. Everything. So there's three means of prayer this morning I want to bring to your attention. Vital for Christian warfare. Three means of prayer. And here's the first one. Prayer is a means of strength in spiritual warfare. Now, if you are there in Ephesians, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And I want you to notice something there in Ephesians chapter 3. It says in verse number 16, it says this. And might, chapter 3, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So in other words, that not only what he's talking about here in Ephesians, but he's heading towards that of prayer, that it is the means of strength, that prayer is the essence of spiritual warfare and the most important means by which believers are strengthened by God. In other words, as I mentioned last time, that putting on Christ makes us able. Ephesians 6.11, you are able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You are able to resist in the evil day. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which in which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So we can all have our ducks in a row spiritually as far as understanding right doctrine and understanding what a believer's conduct should be in the world. But if a Christian soldier attempts to fight, attempts to resist in their own strength, they will be rendered, rendered crippled by the by the enemy and his forces. You see, you can't believe everything correctly. You can do everything correctly. But if you don't believe in the necessity of regular prayer, you are in the battle without comms. That's a military talk for being cut off from vital communication with the commanding officer. And of course, our commanding officer, our Lord is Jesus Christ. See, in other words, if you don't have communication with God, you're on your own. 
So how do we get strong in the Lord and the power of might? Yes, you... By, by knowing the truth of God, yes, but not, it's not just that. It's by a living connection that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we keep on growing in it stronger. We keep on protecting our time when we have our prayer times with the Lord. We, we make it a plan to be with the gathered assembly at least once or twice a month so that we can pray about the things that the Lord has uh, given us and has provided to us. Again, in our passage of Scripture, it says in Ephesians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then, of, of course, the passage that I read in Ephesians 6.18, with all prayer and petition at all times in the Spirit. So there must be a constant contact and communication with the Lord. Christians must maintain an intimate relationship with the one who died in their place, the one who's making intercession right now in heaven for them. And that relationship is maintained by prayer. And for your information, if you did not know this, and you probably didn't, that out of the 155 verses in the epistle of Ephesians, 31 verses are on prayer. That's quite a bit. So Christians, once you put your armor on, once you put on Christ, you are not yet done. We must now put on our armor with prayer. And why is that? Because prayer shows our dependence on our Lord. Prayer means that we are in a living relationship with our God. Prayer demonstrates that the Christian soldier is not attempting to fight in his own strength and power. So Christians do not possess power gained through some driving energy on their own or some polished skill that they have or some trusted methods that they've possibly used in the past. No, believers gain and maintain power for spiritual warfare through prayer. Dr. Roskop, a professor at the Master's Seminary, when I was preaching through Ephesians, I mentioned that he said that we make fools of ourselves, setting ourselves up for mediocrity, emptiness, and disaster if we do not insist to be much in prayer, whatever the cost. And there is a cost. The cost may be a little less time to eat dinner. It may be coming home from work a little earlier. It may, may mean getting up earlier in the morning, less time to watch your favorite programs or to surf, surf some social media sites. There will be some denial uh, of self, some discipline of the flesh, some moving around of the schedule in order to, to be persistent in prayer. Trials, suffering, spiritual warfare all have some connection to affliction, trouble, and friction. Though it's hard to accept at, as, at times that these are not ideal situations. The reason why is we do not become strong, devoid of troubles and problems. We just don't. The opposite is true. Nature even tells us this. A tree planted in a rainforest is never anchored and can be toppled even by a moderate wind. By contrast, a mesquite tree that's planted in a dry desert is threatened by a a hostile environment. How does it survive? By driving its roots down more than 30 feet into the earth, seeking for water. By adapting and adjusting to harsh conditions, the well-rooted tree becomes strong and steady against all assailants. Christians are like these two trees. Those who learn to stand strong in the faith and conquer their problems in the strength and the wisdom of the Lord, they are the ones who are bettered anchored 
and better able than those whose roots are not, have not gone down deep into truth and have not been trained by troubles. So brethren, it was the Lord who told us in the scripture mentioned in, in Luke 18, it reminds us that we are weak without prayer. If we don't pray, we will faint. Luke 18, 1 actually says, now he was telling them a parable to show them, show that all times they ought to pray and not faint. If you don't pray, you will lose heart and you will not be able to fight. Now, we have all, I think, experienced that at some point in our Christian walk because we're, we are all in the same boat. Right? We're all in the same world, in the same uh, context as far as our, where we live, and so we know that it's, it's difficult to plan this into our life and protect it and keep doing it, be persistent in it. So what, what is the character of your prayer life? What place does it that act, actually have in your daily routine? What place does the public prayer have? meetings have in your weekly schedule, in your monthly schedule. So if we, we don't pray, you and I will be weak and faint. Yes, you will and I will get weary in the midst of spiritual battle. The very fact of battle means weariness. But we don't have to be weak and faint in the sense that we give up. You want to be strong in the Lord? Being strong in the Lord Christians can show that they are in touch with Jesus, the commander of the troops, that Christians are to put on the whole armor of God while maintaining constant contact with God in prayer. Now, what are some of the noticeable characteristics of warfare in prayer? Well, there are, in the three means of prayer, that we see that the Bible says that prayer is a means of strength in spiritual warfare. Some of the characteristics are, number one, warfare prayer is multifaceted. Now, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, you will see that it says in the scriptures, with all prayer and petition. So that means that all kinds of prayers we are to pray, uh, the commitment to prayer, all raises the soldier to a state of real, real urgency, the means of all forms and all kinds of prayer. In other, in other words, there's closet prayer. That's a private prayer. There's public prayer. Pray with the church body and in prayer meetings. There, there's heart prayer. No words, just groans. Sometimes we just come to the Lord groaning. We don't even have the words to put in. We're so in a place that we can't even put them into words, and, and God knows our heart. Prayers of praise and prayers of blessing and thanksgiving and confession of sin and affirmation. So there's all kinds of prayers. So prayer is to be multifaceted. Secondly, prayer is to be specific, earnestly specific. It says here, and petitions, petitions, entreaties, supplications, intercessions, prayers with regard to special requests and desires. Keep bringing prayer to God as you see the different needs arising in your life. As it says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about things, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your request be, may, be made known to God. That is something that we ought to be doing. And then, of course, prayer is also constant. We're to pray, it says in verse, this verse, we're to pray at all times. We're to pray at all times. Prayers to be offered at every conceivable time in our life. When things are going good, when things are not going good. When things are full of joy, when things are not full of joy. See, our real obstacle to frequent and constant prayer is often our failure to acknowledge our deep need for God and a, a pressing dependence upon him when we do not sense our weaknesses, our helpness, helplessnesses, our, our dependence, our danger, we'll not pray. 
having an acute awareness of the war and our weaknesses will drive us to our needs. Lord, I cannot do this. I cannot live the Christian life without you, without the strength that you provide for me. I, I cannot do it. I cannot win my family member to Christ or even share the gospel with them without you. I, ca I can't go on this job interview where I'm so full of anxiety and, and nervous about it without you. I, I need your strength. I need your help. So all these things come to our mind and that we're constantly in the attitude of our heart, in prayer all day long. It does not mean we're on our face all day or we're kneeling all day or we even have our hands folded all day. It means that you're driving in the car and your very heart attitude is to be talking to God talking to him about the day, thanking him about allowing you to wake up that morning, allowing you to have this car to drive to work, allowing you to have a job. You're just thanking God. It's just flowing out of you. All right? That's what God wants. And as we do that, when the difficult parts of life come, we're ready for it. It's, it's no, prayer is no stranger to us. It's something that we do. It's the fabric of our whole being in life. We are in contact with God because we know what he's done for us, and he know, we know for sure that he hears us when Satan is lying to us, saying he doesn't hear you and he doesn't care for you. See, we don't believe those lies anymore. And one reason why is that part of prayers, too, is that warfare prayer is with the help the Spirit gives it says in the, our text here that we are to pray in the Spirit at all times. That is the Holy Spirit of God keeping our minds in the mindset of prayer, real prayer. And all prayer must be done in the Spirit. That means negatively repetitious prayers, making long prayers, or prayers just done for the ear of the public is not praying in the spirit, but merely uttering words. Praying in the spirit means your heart is definitely engaged in talking with the Lord. Like it says in, in the uh, passage here in Jude, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit links closely with the word of God and the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit becomes the cutting edge in prayer. It's, the, it's, it's driving our thoughts. So we pray in the will of God. We pray for what God wants in our life. So prayer in the Spirit is inspired, it's guided, and it's made effective through the Spirit of God who indwells us. And there's a second means of prayer, and it's, it's this, that Prayer is a means of watchfulness in spiritual warfare, where it says in verse number 18, it says, with all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert. That means be watchful with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. So warfare watching is a watching in which We are not to fall asleep at the switch. We are not to fall asleep at our post. We must have, as I mentioned uh, years ago, a tobacco juice alertness. Okay, what does that mean? Early American cowboys who took drastic measures to keep alert and hold fast to their work while guarding the cattle at night exemplified this idea, they would rub tobacco juice in their eyes to make them smart or to keep their eyes open and help the riders stay at their vigil even when they were weary. And they did this in the interest of their bosses and the safety of the animals. See, will, will we remain constantly steadfast in prayer for the high interest of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the benefit of his people who are much more important than cattle. 
Will we stay awake for the sake of the church and not fall asleep in this area? See, we are not to give up, to become discouraged when answer to our prayers are delayed because sometimes the answer to our prayer is wait. Sometimes the answer to our prayer is no. Sometimes the answer to our prayer is yes, but not in the way you thought it would be answered. See, we should never give up our responsibility. See, and the reason why is because God knows how to and when to answer prayer. Our responsibility is to keep on praying and to trust God completely for the answer according to his will on his own time. And believe me, when he does that, it's the right time. It's not, the, it's not a forced time. It's not a time that we think he should do something. It's a time when it all comes together. If you've been a believer for a while, you've experienced those times. When you prayed and you prayed and it's, things didn't seem to happen, when you, and then all of a sudden you prayed and it all came together. Because God was doing it at the right moment, at the right time. And underneath that, if you notice, is that warfare watching is connected also with the discipline of prayer, that we are to be disciplined in this matter, as I just mentioned, but it's also connected to that of we are concerned about the needs of others. That's something that's very vital for a Christian. It says there in our passage, verse number 18, verse 18 of Ephesians 6, that are we to give petitions for all the saints. For all the saints. All the saints. So in other words, that our first priority on our prayer list is the church, is believers. And the work believers ought to do. Saints actually describe, describe something that has happened to us, that we have been set apart for God. We are his. We are his property. We are his holy people. We are saints. We are faithful. We are in Christ. We are chosen in the beloved. We are adopted into the family of God. We are his children. God is going to listen to his children we are a special group of people, and so the church ought to be praying for that special group of people. We ought to be praying for each other. So we pray for the saints, and when we pray for the saints, we pray for the sick. We pray for the elderly. We pray for the deacons and the elders, for the widows and the single moms and the young parents and the teenagers. We pray for healing and jobs. We pray for traveling mercies and all things that are on our minds and are involved in our community. Some saints are, in particular, stress and difficulty. We must pray for them also. We should pray that they would stand firm in the faith. That would be one thing that was connected to the armor of God. Matters like truth, matters like righteousness, matters like readiness of the gospel, matters of the realities of salvation, the word of God, prayers that... We offer up to God that will drive back the enemy. That, that saints would be strong in the Lord, we would pray, and, and the strength of his might, and that they would stand firm when things get tough. A one-person army will soon be defeated. We must fight against the individualistic mindset that we are all prone to in our culture in America. It's really not about you, and it's not about me. It's about us. It's about the people of God. And to make that shift in your mind will actually drive you to pray, because I now know that I'm responsible to pray for other people. So when we become Christians, we are actually interconnected with each other like we are really connected to no one else, even our own blood family. We are mutually independent or inter interdependent, whether we know it or not, and nothing can really happen to any one Christian without all being involved. If any one Christian falls, fails, every one of us suffers inevitably because we are all members of the body. We are all 
in this army together until the Lord comes, we're to be doing this. So all of us who are now joined in this new community called the church, we need to intercede for each other. We all need to be able to stand firm in the middle of spiritual battle, and we can't do that alone. So there's actually two dangers that praying for others actually hedge against, dangers that really help us. And what's the, the first danger is just being self-centeredness. That is, you you deal with your problems, your difficulties, your fears in a purely personal way. You see what happens is that we mull over things when we do it alone, and we feel sorry for ourselves, and we end up utterly cast down in our soul. The spirit, the, the devil gains victory. And so what we do is we end up licking our wounds and sulking in our personal battle alone. That's not how God intended it. So really, praying for other people hedges against self-centeredness and aloneness. Secondly, it hedges against isolation. So one other ploy of the devil is to convince you that you are alone and your situation is unique, and no one understands what you're going through and what you're feeling and what happened to you in your struggle, that's not true. That's a complete lie, because Jesus was tempted to the extreme without committing sin. That means nobody was tempted to the extreme and to the extent that Jesus was. So he knows all your struggles. He knows everything all the troubles that you're going through. He knows all of them from the top to the bottom. He knows every single thing that you're going through. So I can't believe the lie that I'm alone. I not only have the Lord with me, but I have the church with me. If the church is truly praying, I know when people say to me, Pastor, I prayed for you. Uh, I know when people pray for me. When I'm out there doing something and and somebody says, I pray for you about a specific thing, and I just feel strength that people are behind me, I can trust them that they're going to be praying for me in what we're doing. And and that is a great, incredible comfort in the church to know that the church is praying. So the remedy is to rise up and pray for all the other saints because they are engaged in the same feelings and struggles that you and I are in. In fact, if you remember, if you remember the passage of Scripture, because I've not been there, and I've been kind of like fleshing it out, if you remember in 1 Peter, again, what it says, I want you to take your Bibles and turn there. I just want to remind you what it says there, that I haven't even gotten to this portion of Scripture yet. Look what it says there. It says it for a very specific reason. 1 Peter 5, verse number 9. It says this, but resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So we can't claim that we're alone. We can't do that. That's a complete lie of the enemy. So the truth about the armor of God is that God and the Lord Jesus Christ are engaged in this battle with us against cosmic forces. We are strong, and we are not alone. We are not alone. Now, if you remember, and for the sake of time, the prophet of Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal in the name of the Lord. It was a tremendous day. Fire came down from heaven. The sacrifice was consumed. All the water that he poured on the sacrifices were consumed. Then, man, he walked away, and and God worked. But then... The wicked Jezebel found out about what happened and threatened to kill Elijah. And what does Elijah do? He runs. He takes off. Matter of fact, he runs and he says to the Lord, Lord, kill me. Take me out of here. The Lord cared for him, though in this way he sent ravens to feed him with food, to give him water. And to give them a good night's rest. And sometimes that's all we need spiritually. Sometimes that's all we need. 
to just get back going again. We wear ourselves down to the point we're not considering our health, that that's part of our spiritual understanding of how to live life, that we have to take care of ourselves, right? So here he is, and this is what happens. It says in 1 Kings, don't turn there, it says, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, this is Elijah, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I am left alone, and they seek my life to take it away. What happened? How did he go from the mountain to the valley so fast? Well, we do the same thing, don't we? There's not many mountain experiences for Christians. There's a lot of valleys. You know why? Because we don't learn anything on the mountain. We learn that in the valley. And then we, when we're in the valley, we understand what the mountain's about. Look, at, look what it says in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. Then he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. This is the second time he says this. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. But look what, look what the Lord says. Yet, this is what the Lord says to Elijah. Yet, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the needs that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, Elijah, you say your own, I got 7,000 part of the army right here at your disposal. What happened? See, that's what the Lord does. We're not alone. Don't believe that lie. That's a lie. And then, of course, where does spiritual strength and spiritual watchfulness, where does it bring us? You know what it brings us? It brings us to this place, and this is really important for you and I as believers. It causes us not to shut our mouth. What do I mean by that? It gives us boldness to live the Christian life, but also to speak for the Lord. Look at, look at the passage, back to Ephesians. Look what it says. So this would be the last one this morning, and it's this. Prayer is a means of boldness in spiritual warfare. It is a means of boldness in spiritual warfare. And this is what it says in Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. And pray on my behalf, Paul is asking the church to pray for him, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness. What does he make known? The mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. If the apostle Paul is asking the church, don't allow Satan to tempt me where I don't say anything when I ought to. When he causes me to keep my mouth shut when I should have spoken. So where does boldness come from? It comes in, in several ways. Number one, boldness, bold, boldness comes by being with the Lord Jesus. Listen to what it says in Acts 4.13. Don't turn there. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So where did boldness come? To these uneducated people from Christ. That they were able to speak very clear, articulate things about truth that pierce people's hearts. And they say, well, hey, these guys don't have any degrees. They didn't go to the, ra the rabbinical schools. They weren't trained by the scribes and the Pharisees. They're just dumb fishermen. How could they speak like this? You know why? Because they've been with Jesus. And how can you speak like that? Right? You've been with Jesus. You've been in the word of God. That's how you get boldness. And when you have boldness, when you have, when you learn something to say, when it's time to say it, you can say it. Because I even know when I talk to people about when we go out and do evangelism, they say, you know what, I never thought. I knew those things until I started talking to that person. And it just started coming out. It just started coming out of me because I've been learning these things. See, don't, don't, don't keep a, a cap on what you know. Let, let it out. Let people know what God's teaching you. And then 
Secondly, boldness comes from prayer. And this is one thing I want to stress where it says in Acts 4.29, and now the Lord look upon, it says, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. And of course, we know from the context this had to do with prayer. And then also the last one, Prayer, boldness comes from the Holy Spirit of God, where it says in Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Here it is again. The response to their prayer was a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, which was manifest in the disciples' Fearless proclamation of the word of God. Prayer is the most thorough test of faith because it reveals to you and to me that we are growing in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of his plan, and are ever being conformed to them, and bold in speaking about them. So what was Paul praying in Ephesians? He was praying that he he would receive boldness to speak forth the mysteries of the gospel as, as he ought to speak. That's what he was praying. But there's a paradox in prayer. And what that paradox is kind of like, it reveals to the enemy that we are totally dependent on God because we do not have supernatural wisdom and power. That must come from the Lord. It cannot come from anywhere else. So here are the the things that are important for you and I, that prayer is a means of strength in spiritual warfare. It's a means of watchfulness in spiritual warfare, and it's a means of boldness in spiritual warfare. Here's a quote that I want to end with from Samuel Chadwick. And he said this, The chief concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He laughs at our toils, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Let's pray. Lord, this morning I I do thank you for this time that you set aside for us today to pray, and to hear the word of God. I pray, Lord, for everyone here, including myself, that we would plan a prayer time, that we would plan a prayer place, a private one for us. But I pray, Lord, that we would also plan to be with the gathered church on Fridays, as many Fridays as we can come to spend that hour and a half with other brothers and sisters just to bring our petitions, our intercessions, and our requests before you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, as we do that, that you would enable us to stick to it and that we would fight for it until we get it. And once we get it, we would keep it. Because we know, Lord, that this is going to be the very strength and joy that we need in our Christian life as we seek your face out, and we see you answer prayer and interact in our our life. We want to praise you, Lord, for all the prayers that we have offered up. Thank you, Lord, for all the prayers that you've answered. But I pray, Lord, there'll be many other requests that we bring before you that you will answer according to your will. And so I pray, Lord, make us a sober, serious assembly of prayer. And I pray this in the great, In the awesome name of Jesus Christ, amen.